Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 7, Jesus warns, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree, tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth fruit evil. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Jesus here, as indeed many times during his teaching, counsels people to use their God-given common sense and not to rely on the high-flown but undemonstrable claims. Common sense goes beyond abstract reason, for it is rooted in actual experience. Even common sense, however, is deficient when the judgment called for goes beyond sensory experience. Ultimately, what he emphasized always, therefore, was intuitive perception. Thus, he expected more of his disciples than crude common sense, and often scolded them for being too literal-minded, as he did elsewhere when they thought that his statement, I have meat to eat that ye know not of, meant that he had steaks or sandwiches secreted about his person. His reference, of course, was to spiritual, not material, substance. Words, even though appearing in the scriptures, are no substitute for direct perception of truth. Therefore, the Bhagavad Gita says in the second chapter, the sage who knows God has as little use for the scriptures as one might have for a pond when the whole land is covered in flood. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Good morning, everyone, and Congratulations on once again navigating through the difficult, bumpy road of daylight saving time. And <laughs> here we all are on time, so congratulations. So I'd like to start by reading from Master's Whispers from Eternity, his book of prayer poems. And this is one entitled, Save Us from Religious Bigotry. Our one Father, we are traveling by many true paths to thy one abode of supreme truth. Help us to understand that the diverse religions are all branches on thy one tree of truth. Bless us that we may enjoy the intuition-tested, ripe and luscious fruit of self-knowledge that hang from every branch of thy true scriptural teachings. Thy temple is but one. Its name is silence. In it we sing thee a combined chorus of many religions. Teach us to chant together in harmony. May the combined expressions of our love for thee make thee break thy silence and lift us up as a mother does her children onto thy lap of universal understanding and immortality. Sing along with us to confirm thy acceptance of our chance to thee. Well, our theme this morning, as Jyotish read, is the comparing the difference in religious thinking and the spiritual life between dogmatism, and common sense. And 
dogmatism, of course, is we see it all around us, very prevalent today, that rigidity of thinking, only my way is right. And um, someone wrote us a beautiful story that they had had the opportunity to go to Medjugorje. For those of you who know, there was a beautiful uh, repeated apparition of uh, Divine Mother in the form of Mary. And there were, I believe, four children that saw her repeatedly over the years. And our friend and some others with him had the chance to go there and visit uh, with one of these uh, one of the people who had seen the vision. Now they're no longer children; they're middle-aged, but this, uh, but they're still very exalted souls, obviously. And um, there were a group of them, and they asked her, um, "What do you say to the fact that only Christians, or even more specifically, only Catholics, will go to heaven?" And this woman, Vika was her name, she surprised them all by saying, there are no Catholics in heaven. And there were Catholics in the group, and they just, oh! <laughs> really shuddered. And she, and she said, I mean, there are only people who love God. They may be Catholics, they may be Jews, they may be Muslims, but that's the definition of who goes to that blessed state. So we, in, we need to understand that even in the yogic tradition, even in the followers of paths of yoga and meditation, there can be dogmatism. My path is better than your path. My uh, techniques of meditation, my techniques of hatha yoga are better than yours. It's the same mentality. It's not being able to see past the limited form to realize that underneath it all, there's only one truth. In fact, this was one of the main missions that Yogananda was given by the great, by Christ and the great masters in coming to the West, was to demonstrate the underlying truth in two specific religions, but by extension, all of them. The original teachings of Jesus and the original truths expounded by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, which uh, by extension is Hinduism. And so this was what part of what Master came to the West to bring, all of us, to have any, probably these great Masters in their prophetic ability could see that the world would be moving into a time of dogmatism and rigidity in politics and religion and so many different fields. And uh, I find, I used to be so confused by the fact, according to our teachings, we're moving into a higher age, the age of Dwapara Yuga, the age of energy. And I, I would get confused because I would think, well, if we're moving into a higher age, it certainly doesn't seem like it. It seems like the rigidity and the dogmatism and, uh, is stronger than I can remember it in my lifetime. And Swami Kriyananda gave us a very helpful piece of advice. He said the rigid forms of the old age of Kali Yuga, as it's called in our teachings, but of a more confined way of thinking, more fixed in form. He said the forms of Kali Yuga are being animated, are being activated by the new energy of Dwapara Yuga. So it seems like they have more power, but it's just like a battery that won't take a charge. You can, you know, hook it up to jumper cables and pour the energy from a power source into that battery, but if it's a dead battery, it won't take the charge. How did I know that? <laughs> anyway, I think, I think what I said is true. <coughs> but it's the same with these forms of dogmatism. The, this power is going into them, but that new energy, that new new wine in old wine skins, as Christ puts it in the Bible, it can't take. And so they may be animated for a while, but then they will play out and they will 
recede because this age, this consciousness won't, that we're living in, the consciousness of this age won't sustain it. But there's another kind, we're talking about the differentiation between dogmatism and common sense in life, in religion. But then there's another way we can fall away from truth, particularly in the spiritual life, and that's spiritual fantasism, where we think, oh, well, Master will take care of me, Swami will take care of me. And in the most profound sense, that's true. But Swamiji in uh, The New Path tells the story of a woman uh, some disciples who are very careless about practical things and they would never lock their car and they said well master will take care of us master will take care of us and master heard about this and he didn't applaud that mentality he said um, I'd like to see me taking care of them if they decide to drive their, their car off a cliff there are laws that govern this universe and we have to work within those laws. And in fact, those women had some valuable valuables in their car and didn't lock it thinking that God will protect them and they were stolen. And so this brings us to what I would like to focus our talk on is to highlight and honor and explore Sri Teshwar, who's at Maha Samadhi is today. And he was uh, Yogananda's guru, for those of you who are new to our teachings. And Yogananda gave him the appellation of a Gyan avatar. And in, avatar means divine incarnation, an incarnation of wisdom or discrimination. And I think he so beautifully exemplifies this differentiation between dogmatism, spiritual reality, and spiritual fantasy. Because he lived right in the, the, the core of truth, where uh, he would, uh, as there's a saying, he uh, does not suffer fools gladly. And Sri Yukteswar did not suffer fools gladly, either be they rigid or be they kind of trying to not understand the spiritual principles on which this whole universe is based. And so looking at the life of Sri Yukteswar, again, an incarnation of divine discrimination, one of the first stories we hear of him where he is a young man and he goes to this big religious fair in India called the Kumbha Mela that happens periodically up in, uh, along the, where three rivers meet up by uh, Hardwar. And he was always a man of no nonsense. A very brilliant man, spoke many languages, was always interested in new scientific discoveries. But there he is in this big religious fair to which millions, literally millions of people go to. I often, I've never been to one. Jatish visited one, perhaps some of you have been there. But it boggles the mind to think water and waste removal and, and food supplies for these millions of people that just appear there at one point. And Sri Teshwar is wandering around, but mentally he's being discriminating. He sees people that are chanting, but their minds are just super, uh, scattered. He sees people, ascetics, that he can tell that it's just a show. They're not, the inner reality isn't there. We've all seen spiritual people like that, that it's a big show, but inside they're not living the truth of what they're trying to express outwardly. And he begins thinking, surely these superficial ascetics are not pleasing to God. Surely the scientific minded men and women of the West who are trying to explore the laws that operate the universe for the benefit of mankind, certainly they are more pleasing to God than, than what's going on here. And just at that moment, a young uh, ascetic comes up to him and says, come with me. And he's a little bit surprised. He said, the, there's someone who wants to meet you. And um, he's brought to the presence of the great Mahavatar, Maha Avatar, 
Babaji. And Babaji says, I perceive your thoughts that you are not pleased with what you find here and your interest is in the West. Some years in the future, I will send you a disciple. And that, of course, was our guru, Yogananda, who will disseminate these teachings of yoga to the West and bring together the scientific and the spiritual in a way that is grounded in reality. And then he also bestowed on him, he called him Swami. And he said, but he called Shri Teshwar Swami. And he said, but I'm not a Swami. He was a married man at the time. And he, he said, those on whom I bestowed this title, those on whom I bestowed this title, never put it down. And some years later, it came to pass. But from the very introduction of Sri Yukteswar, there was that that uh, knife of discrimination that cuts through all my all outward uh, hypocrisy, if you will, all outward shows that aren't grounded in truth. And then we come, we talked earlier in the week about the momentous meeting of Master and Sri Teshwar. But then let's move ahead just a little bit to how Master experienced Sri Teshwar in his ashram. And it's, you know, someone said to Master, one of his disciples when he was in America, we shared this with you, when I look at this disciple, a direct disciple of Master who only knew Sri Teshwar from what he read in his pictures. Uh, this, this disciple said to Master, when I look in Sri Teshwar's eyes, I see so much love. And Master corrected him and said, there was no love in those eyes. <laughs> but I don't want us to be put off by that because when you really try to absorb the vibration of Sri Teshwar, it's thrilling. It's not personal. It's not the way you you feel towards Master where you feel he's your own. But Sri Teshwar is our own if we choose to say, I want truth. I, I don't even want to kid myself anymore. I want to cut away everything that isn't based in truth and reality and, and not just to go for that which is real. And that's what I love about Sri Teshwar. That on flinching desire or per quest that more than desire focus of his life's energy what is true what is real all else I don't want to have anything to do with and that's why he was so hard on his disciples where his master coddled us a little more gave us the ability to play with our delusions a little bit rather than saying what in the world are you doing who are you kidding and which uh Sometimes, whether it comes from our guru or just the world at large, we do get slapped on the side of the head just saying, you are, your, your life is not based in truth entirely. Realign it so that it is. And so in Sri Teshwar's training of Master, just over and again, that by his example, what did he say the highest thing? He said, learn to behave. Learn to make, walk your talk, essentially. Learn to make your actions and your thoughts match the truth that you are aspiring to become. This is a tremendous goal. And he trained Master. He wouldn't let him get away with lapses of memory or, or vagueness in his thinking or letting his mind wander when he was giving him a discourse. And... It's so wonderful to think that the example where Sri Teshwar said, the minds, the lives of all men are dark with many stains. Everything in the future will improve if we're making the right spiritual effort now. So forget the past. Don't dwell on it. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Because it's not true. If we erred, it was delusion. Let's move away from that now. Let's move away from delusion. And that's all it is. It's recognizing what is true and real. And mistakes that we've made are simply ignorance. They're not real. They're not true. And that's why we shared this morning at the purification, guilt is such a waste of time because it's 
affirming that which is not real. I did something wrong. Neither of those things are true. I, the ego, is not true. That which is wrong is not true. It's just ignorance. Much more accurate to say, the God within me lives in truth. And hold that thought. Because that's the truth. That's the reality of our being. And so Sri Yukteswar always was bringing it back to that. Once, again, a story that some rather pompous pundit came and he was holding forth and going on and on, quoting the Bible and, co- not the Bible, quoting the scriptures and make, you know, going on and on. And Sri Yukteswar just sat there, sat there quietly and he said, after the man had spoken for quite a long time, Sri Yukteswar said, I'm waiting to hear you. And the man said, what do you mean? I've been speaking the great truths of our religion for all this time. He said, yes, there have been quotations, many, but I haven't heard anything that comes from your own realization. And the man just sputtered for a while, and then he, how, then luckily he had the maturity to say, essentially, you found me out. I don't have realization. I can quote all these truths, but I don't know them. And so, to... I I offer, I challenge, I invite all of us, try to have Sri Yukteswar walk by your side for a day. And, And watch your thoughts, watch your words, watch your actions. Are they aligned with truth? Are they just rationalizing? Are they delusional? Are they spiritual airy fairy? It's so easy to do that on the spiritual path. And that's where Sri Yukteswar was grounded. He said, your head may be in the clouds, but keep your feet firmly planted on the soil of reality. And um, Master says of him, his only, quote, miraculous air was the aura of total simplicity. Total simplicity because he understood the subtle laws that govern the universe. He didn't have to make a big deal about it. He could perform miracles. He did. But he, to him, they weren't miracles. Because any more than it's a miracle to, to us if we put water on a pot on the stove, turn the flame, and the water boils. It's simple physics. Heat makes things, raises the temperature, and it makes it boil. It was the same thing for Sri Yukteswar, to raise people from the dead, to hold moving trains. He was just working with subtle law, so it didn't seem miraculous to him. And so in our own lives, to try to be as grounded as we can spiritually, and this helps our meditation practice, because if we look at our techniques and say, I will do them, with the same energy that I put into anything else in this world. Because there are laws that govern our spiritual practices and development, just as there are laws that govern how this physical world operates. And then, moving forward, one little quote that I loved of Master about Sri Yukteswar, he said, he, he wore his wisdom without any outward show. He, he said, Master said, in shallow minds, the fish of, of superficial thoughts make a great commotion. In oceanic minds, the whales of inspiration make not a ripple. And, I mean, it's, it's just a, that one thought is worth meditating on, how the depths of our own awareness ultimately should rest in stillness. Like, oh, look what happened spiritually, and I got a parking place, and, you know, all these good things happened to me, and it's just the surface level. Truth is non-demonstrative. I remember some years ago, we were with Swamiji, and we were listening to some classical music. It was a piece by Mozart. And Swami made a simple comment that was so profound, but both spiritually and insightful as far as Mozart as a composer. He said, Mozart was such a consummate artist. He never compromised integrity with showmanship. 
And spiritually, that's a very important distinction. Integrity and showmanship. And in our spiritual life, we never, what's deep and true doesn't have to be shown. Don't wear your spirituality on your sleeve, but live it and make it the reality of who you are. This is what Sri Teshwar brought to us. And then finally, at 1935, um, Master goes back after being in America for 15 years, goes back to see his guru, Sri Teshwar in India. And he of course, it's a very heartfelt meeting as described in Autobiography of a Yogi, but not, there isn't much uh, master's secretary at the time, Richard Wright, describes it in Autobiography. There isn't much exchanged outwardly, but the power of those souls being in each other's presence. And Sri Teshwar knew that it was his time to leave was coming. And Master said, oh, I think I'll go to the Kumbha Mela. You saw Babaji there. Maybe I'll get to see Babaji. And Sri Teshwar's one comment is, I don't think you'll see Babaji there. <laughs> and he was trying to guide Master, don't go. This isn't the time to go. But Master went. Was it a mistake on his part? No, we can't think that. Master is an avatar as well. But he went as he explains, because his heart was so tender, he never was present when anyone very dear to him passed away. So he's away, Sri Teshwar has his Mahasamadhi, as he, today we are celebrating that event. And of course it was very, Master was bereft for such a long time. Then his Master's return to America was slightly delayed for some problem with tickets and so forth. And he was staying in Mumbai, Bombay, in the Regent Hotel. And I'll tell you a little story about that hotel in a moment. But then first he has a vision of Krishna, luminous, coming to him. And then a week later, he's sitting in this room on the second floor in the Regent Hotel and he sees this shimmering light and that light begins filling the whole room and there in the chapter in Autobiography, The Resurrection of Sri Teshwar, Sri Teshwar appears to him. Now just as an aside, that region hotel still exists in Mumbai and we have a, a very dear friend there, Ayesh, if you ever watch this or see this, hello Ayesh. And he's done a lot of research and he went back into the archives of the newspapers in Mumbai and had photographs of all the different changes. It changed hands. Um, it was renovated in different ways. The building still exists, but now it's been changed into an office complex. So there's a corporate office on that second floor where Sri Teshwar and, and Krishna appeared. Yeah, isn't that amazing? India is such an amazing land. And so Ayesh went there and he asked if he could bring people to meditate there and they, they didn't go along with it. But, but there still the, the knowledge exists that some miraculous things happened in this building, but that's as far as they want to go. So, so Sri Teshwar appears before Master, reappears. In, he, in, he, can, he holds him, he feels it. It's not just a dream. It's real. It's, it's a physical form that's there. And he said, you lost sight of this body, you performed the ceremony, and now this is a finer body, resurrected in the astral world. But this body will have to go too. And then Sri Teshwar says to him, and I just want to read the quote, and this is thanks to Larry Ryder who's with us today. This was the quote for today. He, Larry makes a little calendar of sayings from the autobiography, and I just saw this this morning, and I thought, oh great, I've got to read this. So, Sri Teshwar says to Master, all dream bubbles, meaning his, his, uh, this astral body that's there, all dream bubbles must eventually burst at a final wakeful touch. Differentiate my son, Yogananda, between dreams and realities. 
And this is the message of Sri Yukteswar. And this is as we celebrate his Maha Samadhi today. Yes, it's a figure of great discipline and awe, but it's a figure and consciousness that tells us all dream bubbles must burst at the final wakeful touch. And for all of us to differentiate in our lives between that which is a dream and that which is real and live in that to the full extent that we can of the truth of our own being, that we are one with God, in the truth of what Sri Teshwar came to show us, that this world is but a dream, and in the truth of what our Guru brought, that eventually all dissolves in the one truth of divine love.